you for uh, your presence here today, and we thank you for uh, this week, um, the past week, all the many blessings that we have experienced, the people that we have encountered, new friendships that we have made. Um, we pray that you would um, uh, uh, just um, slow us down and help us to look into your word uh, with excitement and anticipation. We know that your word is alive. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, and it um, really divides uh, within us uh, the things that um, do not belong and the things that you want to see. We pray um, that we would be able to let all things go now that, they, that would hinder us or disturb us from hearing you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Doug Minnick uh, had a passage that he was going to read to us this morning. Is that correct? Yes, it is. If I can remember what it was, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we don't have to do it right away. Yeah. And then I see we have somebody with us today. Pillow. It's so nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Welcome. Good to have you today. So, um, yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So what? Mm-hmm. And you know, and that's... It does, but it goes uh, uh, 6, 6 through 11, and it doesn't break each. Romans chapter 6, yes. Mm -hmm. So Romans chapter 6, verse 6. And we're talking about the new life in Christ. And if I'm not mistaken, did we read that uh, in connection with sin or was it in connection with the resurrection and new life? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Okay, great. Looking here at Romans 6 6 in mind, this is the uh, common English Bible. And here it says, uh, But if we died with Christ, no, that's not the one. Let's see here. This is what we know. The person that we used to be was crucified with him in order to get rid of the corpse that had been controlled by sin. That way we wouldn't be slaves to sin anymore. Um, and, you know, the scripture says that the wages of sin is death. You know, that there is a result of that. And if nothing else, um, you know, I mean, the physical death, yes, um, that's the consequence that that's why we all have to die you know, because of the consequence of sin. But uh, the wages of sin also bring spiritual death. You know, it's like, you, know, you can't keep on sinning and also, I mean, I guess, have half of our foot in our relationship with God and half of our foot uh, on the other side in the world. Or, um, you know, my wife and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, when I drive home, we call each other, and so we catch up. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is what happened on her end. This is what happened on my end. And we were talking about how, uh, or she was saying that, you know, uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so if we, and, and being friends with the world doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, or let me, let me ask, what does that mean, being friends with the world? What, do, what does the Bible mean by that? 
because we all live in the world, but we're not of the world. So what does that mean? You know, we talked about that last week. I um, was uh, talking to somebody maybe after the uh, celebration of life service yesterday, and we, we talked about that last week, how, you know, um, you know, we are supposed to pray for our government. You know, we live as U.S. citizens. We live as, um, you know, citizens of this world and all of that. But we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot do things that go against a higher law of God. And what we said as an example was when this whole new health insurance thing came out, there were some Christian companies and some denominations who said we cannot go along with some of the things that are, um, that are under that. And so they said we opt out of it or we're not going to go for that. And I don't know how they did that or, you know, how that all worked out. But basically we followed it along. And then you said that there was something that your children were doing in school, right? What was it again? about authority, that's right. The difference between authority and power. So being in the world but not of the world means just that, that you know, we have to always check our conscience against the higher law of God. There's a great scene in the movie The Hiding Place where they have been discovered that they're hiding Jews and they've been betrayed actually by someone. And uh, they're all being transported to a prison in Amsterdam and uh, their father at that time, Mr. Ten Boom, was like in his uh, late 80s or mid 80s. And uh, this, um, this uh, officer, German officer, walks up to him and says to him, um, Mr. Ten Boom or Ten Boom, something like that, uh, he addresses him and he says, if you promise that you will no longer do what you have been doing, meaning hiding Jewish people in your house, then uh, you can go back in your house and die in your bed, old man. And he looks at him and he says, if tomorrow somebody knocks at my door and asks for help, I will do the same thing again. And so they send him off and he ends up dying, uh, uh, forgotten somewhere in a hospital, in a, in a hallway, um, not the way how he would have wished or his family would have wished. But basically what he, and even while they're interrogated in the house, it's really a great, great scene. The, the officer walks up to him and says him, shows him the Bible and he says, okay, old man, what does it say in this book about obeying uh, the, the laws of the land or something like that? And he said, yes, uh, as long as it's not against the higher law of God. And so, uh, you know, there is a reality to that in our own lives. And um, so how do we figure that out? You know, like um, to, because sometimes we also feel we also feel like overwhelmed and we think, oh, well, we really can't do anything or we can't, you know, raise a voice of awareness. This morning I saw a very disturbing report on BBC News about the forgotten children of China. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but they're saying that there was a, a survey done by the Chinese government that about 60 million children are left behind by both parents who have to go into the cities uh, from the rural areas and work, and they're considered migrant workers, and they don't have the necessary documentation to take their children with them. So out of the 60 million, about 59 million of them stay with a close relative, mostly grandparents, and some of them don't see their kids only twice a year. Only two times a year, and they were interviewing this little girl. I mean, she must have been, what, 10 years old, who was watching her brother who's younger than her, and the guy who was interviewing her was asking, if you get a chance, go home and watch this interview, it's really something. Um, and they were asking the little girl, like, how does that feel like when you have problems in school and when you are, you know, when things come up in your life, you know, like, and you can't talk to your mom or dad. And, you know, she was very mature about it, <laughs> but yet she did break down crying. And the reporter was saying, so here's the balance between somebody who is forced to be an early adult, but yet is still a child, you know? So, um, you know, you see something like that and you say, oh, the church must rise, the church must do something, you know? There's a new mission field, talk about mission field, you know? And, and you know what, and as much as we want the mission field always to be in our safe neighborhood, in our area, it isn't always like that. You know, sometimes we do have to go beyond our borders and to see what is it God, that God wants us to do. And I'm not saying, you know, that this would be our mission, but what I'm saying is 
God will surprise us when it comes to missions of what he's going to ask us to do. And it's not always in our own area and in our own backyard. You know, missions is a, is a tapestry of, of many different areas. And if it's a small thing that we can do, um, then that's great. Um, but sometimes he's going to ask us also to take big steps and bold steps. Um, and um, so, again, my question is, what does that mean to be in the world but not of the world? Hmm. as much as we do. At least that's my experience. Hmm. Not to say that it's wrong. But, you know, it's, it's pretty... Uh, my experience is that it's pretty stark. You know, uh, I've got to get by. And if my wife can't get by, if my children can't get by, that's too bad. Mm-hmm. They're going to fall by the wayside. And maybe somebody will take care of them. But there just isn't that responsibility. Hmm. Hmm. And read about it. And I think an example is that the forgotten children of China. You, you know, they, they don't. Mom and dad are just trying to get by. I read that report. And you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's been maybe twice a year. It's not like they're making a week, week, and week for it. They were dreaming of something like that. They're coming in from miles and miles and miles away. They have no money. They can't get back even if they want. Yeah. When we were discussing this this morning, Connie said, you have to be wrong with your number, 60 million, you know? Yeah. And that's what I thought. I'm thinking, wow, wow, you know, it's like that's such an exuberant amount of children, you know, but it's true. I mean, they repeated it and showed the numbers and that about 59 million of them are with close relatives, but 2 million aren't. They're completely left for themselves to fend for themselves. Go ahead, Dave. And you know, when I ask myself that, yeah, go ahead, sir. Mm-hmm. And 
Mm-hmm. No, that's good. That's good. Were you going to say something? And, you know, it is a learning process. Um, you know, it's like when you, when you first do become a Christian, it's not like that, oh, you, you have all of these senses and all this understanding of what God's will is and, and, um, and walk in his ways. It's like you, you rely on other Christians around you to teach you about these things, you know. And um, the one thing that, uh, um, that came to my mind is when you were talking about TV is we see that, um, and I see that in your children too, that there is a little bit of an age difference. So when, uh, when our son was little, uh, we taught him what to watch out for and you know, to change the channel or whatever, to be very sensitive of what's on and then um, you know, to shield yourself from it because that's what we have to do, that's what we have to learn. So now uh, when something comes on, we noticed him monitoring it for Caroline. You know, he'll say, oh, no, and click, you know, and so, uh, and you know what, and we're all not the same either. You know, some people are more sensitive and they are more, even though we can learn and we can be trained in those things, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that his, his conscience and his, um, his sensitivity to those things is much more alert than hers is. And so he's monitoring her and helping her in that, in that uh, and it's probably getting on her nerves and all of that good stuff. And that's neat. That's neat to see that, you know, that, that, that it has taken root in their hearts and now they're sharing that. Go ahead. No, no. Everything that's going on in this world, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, things are just so upside down in this world that you can't you can't fathom. I I turn a TV on or any major on for three minutes, and I hear these talking heads <laughs> argue. I'm go I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, go ahead. You mentioned the wisdom of the, the Washington, D.C. I think it's a really definitely a different perspective of what, how they view what's going on in the country. Mm. As opposed to the complicated political inherent of mm. And this is BBC America, though. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. I know what you're saying because they, yeah. Um, you know, going back to what, what um, some of us said here about you know, being in the world but not of the world, I think the question or the, the decisive factor is who sets the standard, all right? Does, does the world set the standard for us or do we look to Christ and say, is he setting the standard? You know, and if we say he goes ahead, he leads, then we have to look to him and say, you know, okay, Lord, um, um, kind of like that example with Mr. Ten Boom, if it's against the higher law of God, then I cannot be part of that. You know, and, and, uh, and, you know, it's kind of amazing how easily we can get, be, get as desensitized to it, do, too, though. You know, it's like uh, the more, it's kind of like um, I, a good friend of mine was telling the story about the frog that ends up in the, in the pot of water. And uh, if, you, if you put the frog into a hot pot of water, the frog is going to jump out, is going to, you know, make sure that he doesn't stay there. But if you put the frog into cold water and slowly start turning up the heat, he's going to die because you get desensitized to it. You know, it's like you keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. And, you know, and um, our standard is definitely the standard that Christ sets. And we have to constantly check our hearts, you know, um, against, okay, so what does, what does Christ say to that? All right. Um, uh, so let's go into, um, you know, we'll just start out here with love. Love is more important than other traits. Um, you know, and why is that? Uh, you know, if you go back uh, a few chapters in Corinthians, um, Paul is, um, they're talking about spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are not to be, um, you know, um, discounted or uh, put into the corner. They're very important. I mean, what would we do if we wouldn't have people that are good teachers or that are, um, you know, called um, to be missionaries, that are, um, you know, um, have the different, uh, you know, um, um, traits, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, all these things are uh, very important, but when we, uh, and you know, when they're talking about spiritual gifts in the book of Corinthians in chapter 12, you know, they're putting such an emphasis on it, and we can fall into that mistake, that we look at the gifts more than what, sh what should motivate the gifts. And everything that we do if we are not having the foundation of love with it, remains meaningless. You know, we can go through, I mean, I guess I could be a caregiver to somebody who is really sick, but if I do it out, only out of a sense of duty and there's no love, the person who is receiving the care is going to feel that. So I go through the motions, but I'm not giving any love. That person is eventually going to look at me and say, hey, there's something amiss here. You know, it's like, like, um, 
you know, and that is not to say that we can't get stressed out or that we don't struggle at times. You know, there's such a thing as burnout and all those kind of things. Like I remember a particular situation where somebody was taking care of their mother and they had to do something for her and uh, she was stressed, she was upset. And the mother said to her, so why are you angry now? So they had to face that moment. But when you have a good relationship with each other, then you can say, well, you know what? Yes, you're right. I'm wrong. I shouldn't be acting that way. And um, I'm sorry. And then you just start all over again. You know? Um, so that is not to say that we're not going to struggle with that. But the motivation still has to, the, the foundation or the essence has to remain. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, you know, all these things are important, but let me just tell you what's most important. And the most important thing is, no matter what your spiritual gift is, no matter how talented and gifted you are to do the work of God, if you don't have love, you have nothing. You're not going to accomplish anything in the end. Uh, there's a passage in scripture where it says it's all wood, hay, and stubble, meaning it's all going to burn up in the end. You know, so, um, you know, I mean, just probably to me, one of the greatest examples in, in more modern times is the story of Mother Teresa, you know? I mean, here's this frail little woman from, you know, Skopje, uh, you know, which is um, uh, Macedonia, and uh, close to the Albanian border of Albanian descent. You know, she ends up in uh, Calcutta, I believe it was. And then out of the clear blue, God one day says to her as she's on a way, on a train to a spiritual retreat, um, for her to leave the safe, uh, confounds of a uh, elite girls school and go out and start a school in the slums you know and it didn't it take it took many years before the Pope and the Vatican ever approved or support not approved but supported her in that work and I think I told you that she had a broken uh, um, you know blackboard uh, with a piece of chalk and had a stand for the blackboard and a chair and she set that up in a, in, a, in a corner of a slum and started inviting the children and teaching them how to read and write. That's how her ministry started. And now it's worldwide. And she received the Nobel Peace Prize and all of that. And, um, but I guess my point is she couldn't have done what she did and have such an impact if love wasn't in it. And what motivated her is, if you read a little bit about her life story, was the love of, for Christ. You know, she had a love for the Savior, and that motivated her to make a difference in people's lives. Um, so, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 is a reminder for us, not just a passage that we read at a wedding or when we, when we want to feel good, but it's, it's a stark reminder of not losing focus in church and church ministry of what really matters. So... Um, and you can't be in relationship with each other, whether that's at home or in the church, without applying a good, healthy portion of love every day. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I shared this 13. Mm -hmm. From Martha to Mary. Mm -hmm. And I think that it it means not Hmm. The part where you fill the barn. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it it's complete. It's all of it. You know, like you said, the marriage part, but this isn't just about that. I mean, yes, we read it at weddings typically, but um but uh, uh it's it's uh it's it's for any human relationship because I just um you know, we've talked about this here before that basically it all love feeds out of this love of of god's love which is the foundation for everything all right so um well why don't we just read through it let's read through first corinthians 13 if you have your bibles let's go there and let's just read through it and as you as we do uh, we can just go around and whoever wants to start start reading maybe a couple verses and then we move on to the next person but if there's something that stands out to you that you feel like oh this is really important then let's stop and talk about it Okay. 
had stopped right there. I don't know how the message translates it, but it's either squeaking gate, rusty gate, uh, or somewhere like a barking dog. I've even, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like when you hear a barking dog all night, your hair stands up on end, right? You go like, oh, just stop already. You know, it's kind of like that. That's what he wants to get across. Go ahead. Let's stop there for a second. Can you imagine a faith that can move mountains? And that's what he's talking about, right? If I have a faith that can move mountains, but I, have, I don't have love, what does it say? But I have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. I mean, you know, we would look at a person like that and say, like, wow, look at him or her, you know, what kind of faith they have. But so how is that possible to have that much faith in God, but yet have no love? Uh huh. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So basically, maybe the focus would go away from God and on the person. You know that look how gifted, how talented I am, and and um, and so the focus shifts away from God, and then love is missing. Mm hmm. It can shift. It can shift. We can start out good, you know. I mean, just like the Apostle Paul says, I have run the race, right? I have finished, and now I get the crown of life. You know, so there's, there's an order in that, but just because we start the race doesn't mean we're going to finish it. We have to finish, but the only way is it goes back to what you said. We have to keep our eyes on Christ. And so Christ is the goal. He is the, you know, we have to keep that. And I told you last week that how uh, the biggest mistake we can do when we do distance running is to keep watch for our neighbor where they're at. And that's, I remember that my coach telling me that. It's like, you're a good runner, but you don't keep your eye on, on who's behind you or next to you. You keep looking ahead. Because if you, if you don't do that, you lose a lot of energy. Just keep looking back, you know? And so keeping our eyes on, on the goal. Um, so, but again, you know, I think this is important enough uh, uh, to stop here longer that, that they have immense faith, faith, they accomplish a lot, but yet love is missing, and so therefore they're nothing. I mean, I think that's, that's very significant because, um, uh, you know, even in ministry, we can lose a sight of what ministry is all about. You know, and any time, I mean, I, I don't think I have to say that, but, you know, having looked back on Sunday about all the things that we've done, it's great to pat each other on the shoulder and say, oh, look, look all the things that God has done through us. But we had to have that last slide, which was glory goes to God. You know, because if the glory goes to us, then we've already received our reward. But if the glory goes to God, then he'll make sure that we'll be rewarded for it. You know, so the focus has to always stay on him. Okay. And though I sow all my goods to be poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Okay, so body to be burned means to die as a martyr. You know, that's what that means. You know, a martyr's death. Um, are there modern day mar martyrs for the cause of Christ today, you think? Yes, there are. There is a ministry called Voice of the Martyrs. Anybody has heard of them before? Uh, was founded by uh, a uh, Romanian Christian, uh, Richard Wormbrand. He passed away and so did his wife. They were in uh, communist prisons in uh, Romania in the 50s and 60s. And it was Billy Graham who had him first in one of his crusades and after that, he wrote a book. It was entitled, it's, it's a bestseller. You can get it today. It's called Tortured for Christ. And it was, uh, it was, I read that book early on in my Christian walk, and it's, I mean, it's, it's nothing for the faint of heart. That's all I can tell you. You know, I mean, he uh, goes into great detail about everything that they went through, uh, that he went through, his family, 
and they immigrated to the States eventually, and he started this ministry called Tortured for Christ, uh, not Tortured for Christ, The Voice of the Martyrs. And, um, and uh, uh, over the years, uh, we have been in touch with one of their missionaries, and, and uh, it's an inter you can get the magazine for free, and basically what they do is they will, um, they will update you on what's happening in the world today. And going back to BBC News again, they had a report last week about how, you know, we look at the Chinese government and saying, oh, they're fairly lenient towards the Christian church now. They're more, more generous and all of that. Well, yeah, they are if you, if you line up with their agenda. And I told you that when I studied in Hungary under communism, I, we had an office of the government called the Office of, of Government and Church Affairs. And so that meant the government hired the pastors and the government fired the pastors. And the government set in on the services, and if you said something that didn't fit their agenda, you could lose your job. You know, so that's kind of how we have to picture that today, that the government has great control of the church still, and they were showing scenes about these churches in China. There was one in particular, it looked like it was like in a, in a residential neighborhood, and they had a cross on, on their building and the government came in and tore down the cross, and, you, and the people inside the church were crying and, uh, and watching that happen. That's today. So we do have modern persecution of the Christian church and, and also martyrs that die for the cause of Christ. Go to places like Iran. You know, I mean, uh, pastors are imprisoned all the time for preaching the gospel. And sometimes there, it becomes public enough that there is pressure on the government and for our government to step in and, um, and to speak up and have them released or, or go free. So it happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely they are. And, uh, and, uh, and it happens. It, it happens, yes, where they are either kidnapped or they go and burn down churches. Um, so it does happen. So I guess, why are, why are we talking about that? Well, maybe we're talking about that today because we need to pray for them. We need to pray um, that uh, either to show us what we can do or also to pray that God would provide help for them and, um, and protect them, you know, in, in those vulnerable times. You know, I was always so impressed by the Christian church in the former Eastern Bloc countries we had this, these wonderful neighbors um, in the former Yugoslavia. And you know, Yugoslavia was not the typical Iron Curtain country. We had passports, we could travel all over the world. We had, we had certain freedoms, but it was certain freedoms. You still had to request, if you wanted to have an evangelistic meeting or something, you had to go to the government and ask for, for permission. So there was this tiny little uh, evangelical church and they had above their entrance, come and worship the Lord. The, uh, a scripture. And, um, and, you know, whether communist times or not, they faithfully, every Tuesday they had their Bible study, every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening they had church services, and I saw them walk down that long stretch of road, go faithfully to their church, whether church was popular or not. And that warmed my heart. It really, I looked at that and said, man, these are really sold out Christians, uh, whether it's popular or not. You know, and, um, and I look at you today being here and wanting to be in the Word as, as something that, that blesses me because, you know, you are preparing yourselves for the days ahead. For your days ahead. And by that, I mean, none of us knows what tomorrow will bring, but by us being in the Word today, uh, um, we're putting on the armor of God. You know, for the days that lie ahead, and we don't know what those days will bring, but we need to be prepared, you know? And um, I don't know, is, do you think it's possible that there's going to be a day when we're going to be persecuted in this country for being a Christian? Well, it's, if it's possible somewhere else, it's possible here, you know? So we do need to be prepared. And, um, you know... Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, 
And you know, I want to connect to that because I think sometimes when we're new Christians, we can have so much zeal that we just plow over everybody and everything. You know what I'm saying? It's like we come in like a bulldozer and we don't care what anybody says. That's our first zeal. And that can be destructive too. So I think when we say, I mean, I don't think that you go out or any of us want to go out and, and purposefully offend anybody. But sometimes the truth is offensive, you know? Uh, sometimes it's going to come across not because of how, what you are saying and not because of how you are saying it, but what you are saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, even if we say the truth, it still has to be in, in love. And that's the fine line. How do we figure that out? You know? You pick your moments. Okay, so that's true. Well, I guess that would be very true that if you're in a group of people and somebody... Uh, you know, as, and a topic comes up that, that needs to be addressed, maybe it's not the time to address it when 15 other people are listening, but maybe you do that one-on-one. -on -one. So how do we do that to, to present the truth of the gospel with, without being purposefully offensive? First thing I learned was to talk with basic manners. Oh, okay, basic manners. Mm -hmm. makes them think that church is home. And your love as a grandmother. Mm -hmm. You know, your power as a grandmother in that aspect and your influence over her is, is uh, immeasurably valued. You know, I'm sure um, uh, you, sometimes, you know, we don't see that, but, you know, uh, the fruits, uh, it's like a seed that's being planted and it starts out slow and it's important. Okay, so just basic manners, yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, resurrection of Jesus. Uh, no, we are not done with 13 yet, sorry. Verse 4, okay. Love is patient, or kind, love is not envy, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irrational, or irrationally irritable, or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Yeah. Wow, quite a list, huh? Let's start to get to work, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's a list. You know, you go down there and say, well, I know I've done that, and I know I have fallen short in that area, and, and I, I need to grow here. So it's, um, it's, it's a... It's an image that's placed before us, and uh, like we said a moment ago here, um, only through the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit within us can we grow in these areas. Willpower, as important as it is, and we do have to do our part, is not enough to have the fruits of the Spirit. That's why it's called the fruits of the Spirit. Not the fruits of Attila or the fruits of, you know, anybody, but it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit within us but I do have to be willing to let that happen. So it's an opening up. And you know what? And that's what happens on Sunday morning. Um, you know, we, we might come in with preconceived ideas. We might come in stressed. We might come in disappointed. We might come in with high expectations. Whatever our condition is that we come in, the one thing we can do to prevent ourselves from being disappointed is to say, Lord, I am here to receive from you. What do you have for me today? And if it's, you know, um, 
if it's just one little uh, tidbit that you are taking away and maybe, um, okay, I read that and I sa I'm saying, well, I've been envious and that's not good. Or maybe I'm currently envious, you know, whatever the uh, case might be. Lord, help me to let that go. So that openness and that opening up towards the flow of the Spirit is very important. I just want to jump in with one thing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the ability and the necessity to believe in him, that we have the hope because we all get these doubts with different things, right? Knowing and the gift of hope. Yes, that is true. And hope does not disappoint. That's what the scripture says, if it's the right kind of hope. You know, if I say, oh, I hope I will be, um, you know, powerful tomorrow. Uh, that's, you know, it might happen, it might not happen, and it's, a, it's, it's fleeting. Um, but this is just an example. Or I, I hope I will be, um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, super tall tomorrow or, or, you know, I mean, you know, you name it, whatever, you know, because we all have these, these things that, that maybe we, we wish we would have or we wish we would be like, you know. Those things might happen, they might not happen. But the thing when it says that hope does not disappoint, this isn't just any hope, it's our hope in the risen Christ. You know, like it says, come risen Lord. I was looking at that during the service yesterday. You know, how fitting for that uh, celebration of life service, you know. That, yeah, that's the perfect banner. Come, risen Lord. That's why we can celebrate life, and that's why we can look to Christ and say, yes, even though this all is so hard and so difficult to let our loved one go, but because you are the risen Savior, we have a hope that nobody can destroy, that nobody can take away from us. All right? Any other questions? Anything else? So go on, please, John. Okay, so here is a list of gifts in the church that are not to be disregarded. They're important, you know, and I mean, especially when we're talking about prophecies, prophecies are important, and, uh, you know, that helps us keep our focus on uh, what God is doing in this world and that we're heading towards uh, his return, you know, that he is coming back for his people, he is the bridegroom, we are the bride, and we are to be prepared for that coming. So that, those prophecies are important, but it says we prophesy in part, and even those will disappear, but this love um, that's founded on everything that Christ has done for us will not, not disappear. And you know, let's go back to who Paul used to be, because we're studying the life of Paul. Paul was a hater. He didn't know much about love. He um, persecuted the church. He witnessed Stephen to be stoned to death. He is going to persecute more Christians and put them into prison. And God knows do what else to them, maybe kill them, I don't know. But he was on a mission that was filled with hatred. And he encounters the living Christ and it changes everything. It changes everything. And, you know, it's like, you know, when we're, we're talking about... Um, you know, let's say if somebody's struggling with a drug addiction, for example, just going into a 30-day treatment program is not going to help that person. That's a beginning, but you will, if you talk to a counselor, for example, you will figure out real quick that it's a lifestyle change that needs to happen. And, um, and the way how that happens is you need to get out of your own environment you're probably going to have to cut up a lot of your old friends. You know, you need to get away from what used to draw you. And, and so um, he was isolated for, what, three days? 
was it three days, that after three days he got his, and it's kind of interesting how he, he couldn't see, you know, that I'm sure there's a purpose behind that too. It wasn't just that, oh, God wanted to strike him blind for a few days, but there was a message behind that. And, uh, and I think it's, um, it's that thing that uh, once I was blind, but now I see. It's, it's getting away from the spiritual blindness. Okay, don't look back, but look forward. That's right. Well, uh, it's that other scripture that Jesus said, you know, anyone, any, anyone who's called into the kingdom of God uh, and they have laid their hands on the plow, they should not look back. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that there are certain things we have to leave behind, and sometimes that means our friends. Mm -hmm. So Paul, uh, Paul's life completely changed, and he was able to see more about this love. And I'm sure as he was writing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he was writing this to himself too. So that's important to see that. Any, anything else? Let's, let's keep on reading. Okay, so Christ already knows us, that's what he's saying, but then in face to face in heaven, I will know Christ just as much as he knows me. So the, the fellowship isn't going to be distracted or interrupted anymore. Um, I mean, let's face it, uh, there is something to the fact if I'm sitting in the sanctuary and I, I take time to be silent before God or even if I'm sitting here in a Bible study, there's something about that that's different than praying in the car while I'm at the red light, right? There is something about that because this place is, is sanctified unto the service of God and I have uh, an appointment with God here. You know, it's a little bit different. I still think about that scripture that we read from Kings on Sunday that they had to interrupt the service. <laughs> I mean, I thought about that several times this week. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that the presence of God was so thick and so overwhelming that the priests just had to stop doing what they were doing because God showed up, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and that can, God bless you, and that can happen um, with, even with our church services. Sometimes we just have to go with the flow, you know? I mean, yeah, we might have planned something, but if it doesn't work out that way, it isn't going to be the end of the world. We have to be flexible enough to let God's spirit move freely, you know? And, um, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but there was something else you read. Can you read that passage again, that part that you just read? The one about the mirror? No, uh, uh, even above that. When I was a child, there it is. when Paul was a child, I understood what it meant. I saw as a child, but when I became a man, I put away all these things. Okay. So, well, that all may, we understand that. Yeah. You know, we understand that. When our children are born into our family, we know um, that they're completely dependent on us. Completely. I mean, they can't feed themselves. They can't change themselves. They can't be put into the crib or taken out of the crib. Everything, they're depending on us. But that doesn't last. As a matter of fact, like a good friend of mine said, Attila, it's a one-way street. They'll go up. And we're, we're right now looking at our children and say, a few more years, and they're no longer going to be with us. And we're dreading that moment, but we also know it's the natural thing, and it has to happen that way. But the, the point that Paul is making here is we do have to progress. And there's something unnatural about us being stuck in the same spiritual condition. We, you know what I'm saying? We can't, we can't get stuck in childhood in our walk with Christ. We have to mature. We have to grow up. And I tell you what, there are some tough lessons that you learn as a Christian. You know, I mean, I would say that the first two years of my Christian walk were like, oh, this is great. You know, I have something I never used to have. And I remember making my bed and looking at a scripture that I had, um, that I had put above my, my bed. And it was, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. All things work together for the good of those who love him. And I would look at those scriptures and say, this is great. But eventually the valley came. 
And it's in the valley where we start growing. Well, and it's part of the maturing process. Yeah. You know, we can't always live on, on you know, the, the, the soft milk food, but we have to grow up and start chewing on the steak and on the hamburgers and, you know, on the, on the more mature stuff. But that's hard. It's a hard lesson to learn, you know, the, the growing up in Christ. So, and the growing up is, yes, I do have a Savior, but yes, I also have a cross to bear. You know, and I love that scripture where Jesus said, well, the disciples aren't better than the master. <laughs> you know, that's paraphrasing it. But what he's saying is like, if I had to bear the cross, you have to do the same thing. So, you know, there, we do have to grow up and we do have to mature and some lessons are difficult to learn. And a matter of fact, you know, when you look at Psalm 23, it's so interesting that, that, um, that the psalmist is almost encouraging himself and he's saying, even though I have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and it doesn't just mean physical death, but it could mean, oh, I am struggling with um, depression. I'm struggling with, um, you know, loneliness. Uh, you know, you name it. You could make a list. Uh, and the valley of the shadow of uh, death has many different faces. It's not just physical death. But then he says, but... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So he's building himself up. And sometimes, you know, you need to do the same thing. I need to do the same thing. This is what this feels like, but in my head and in my understanding about who God is, I know that he is with me. You know, so you need to build up your own faith at times, because guess what? There isn't, it, isn't, it isn't always Sunday morning. We know that. And so you being, it's like, it's like a funnel that's being funneled right now in your heart and soul so that on Wednesday or on Thursday of next week when you're going through something, you can remind yourself and say, yeah, even though. I mean, isn't that great that you don't have to physically hurry to the church building to get that? Because Christ lives within you. Mm -hmm. um, what a beautiful church we have. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, it, it is. But you know, it's not just the local building. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It's true. It's part of the normal. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I highly doubt that it is really a whole lot about the building anyway. You know, but it is, you know, I think it's, I mean, we're blessed, no doubt. You know, it's a beautiful sanctuary. I agree. I love that it's so bright. There's light in here. You know, it's not... Uh, you know, it's, it's not stuffy. It's not a museum. I mean, you know, you come to VBS and you'll figure out it isn't a museum. You know, I love that. <laughs> you know, because we're transforming the whole place and it doesn't look anything like a sanctuary and it still works. Matter of fact, we have some changes coming this year for the VBS that, <laughs> that we're all excited about. And I think it's going to be a good thing. Um, but, but uh, yeah, it isn't about the building. It's true. Although, you know, so many times when immigrants came to America, one of the first things they built was a church. Yeah. You know, you went to a Polish neighborhood or an Italian neighborhood. What was the focal point of the community? Oh, the church. Well, because it's the family. That's right. That's right. And that was, uh, it was probably the faith that got him here in the first place, you know, that made him brave enough to go across the, uh, the big pond and, and start life anew, you know, so... It is important, but it's not all important. All right, so how much time do we have? Well, it's noon on my watch. I'd like to one the last. David should read 13. Okay. David, do you have your Bible? So Cindy talked about hope. We talked about faith. And, you know, Paul doesn't dis diminish them. He says, you know, faith, hope, and love, these are great. But even of those, the greatest is love. And, and we just have to keep our, reminding ourselves that this is the love of God, not human love. Because human love is going to run out. It's going to be here today, gone tomorrow, uh, a hot flame today, 
and little, you know, barely existing flame tomorrow. But God's love is always steady, the same. It doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Agape love, that's right. All right, so next week, um, hopefully, <laughs> we'll be getting to the resurrection and the return of Christ. As somebody was saying to me, can you send me the scriptures that you're doing today? I said, well, I can, but that doesn't mean we're going to cover them. <laughs> I can do that. So. That's right. I'll clarify that uh, next week. We'll, we'll talk about all that. Yes. We'll, we'll figure that out. Yes. Next week. All right. Um, let's close in prayer. And then uh, we have lunch together. For those of you who don't always come, we have lunch after and then um, uh, spend some more time together. Lord God, we are just so grateful and that we have a hope that's eternal, not here today and gone tomorrow. So we set our eyes on you and we ask you to guide and lead us individually as families, as your people, as your church. And we do pray for the persecuted church around the world uh, in countries where it's not uh, natural to just go to church and have a Bible study. Um, some people have to live in fear being a Christian um, or even their life is in danger. We pray that you put your protection around them that you provide shepherds that are strong in their leadership um, and help them um, to, uh, um, to remain strong in their walk with Christ. And uh, we pray for our government, our upcoming elections, and uh, all the different things that are going on in our nation that you would just um, um, show us as Christians what we have to do. Well, for one, we have to go out and vote and make our voice count. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Bless the food that we're about to eat and keep us all safe in Jesus' name. Amen.